What's up? Welcome in Hogue and John's with you. Well, at least Hogue with you. Kevin Fishbane filling in today, the fish man for Adam John's. Uh, how you doing, buddy? It's really unfortunate that I don't have a John's impression yet because his, his his voice is distinct. He's got that Johnsy accent, and I just don't have it down yet. You'd think after being in the car for like a combined nine hours together, Thanksgiving, I'd, well, I'd have it. I have to say though, you did a pretty good John's impression by showing up fifteen late, fifteen minutes that, late. Yeah, to listen, it's got to you know. I have to. I have to do my best. A little bit. So here's the other question though. If let's say I'm the Josh McCown of this podcast, yes. right? Like the backup who, when I come in there, I've got this. Would that make John's Jay Cutler? What Ooh. does that make you? Ooh, it, it's, are, are you does, saying that while, like, right now, no one is going to claim that? You should start over John's like five years down the road. There might be Ooh. very well-informed people in the league. You find out we're really saying the whole time that the fish man should be starting. And I mean, that just John like he shouldn't be getting the lucrative long-term extension. Just like he was doing in 2014 on the game. You know, Mark Carmen is screaming into the ether that uh, that I should be starting here. Well, all right, here, let, let's let's play this out. So He's never going to let that go against me, by the way. No, of course not. So John's is Jay. How about your Brandon Marshall in, oh. the, in this specific scenario? So I'm stepping in. How for nice Jay of you to say. I'm still, I'm still get well. Although Josh didn't really throw the ball to Brandon, he threw it to Alshon Jeffrey. So this whole thing is really. I need better. We need better analogies. I'm yeah. happy to. No matter what, I'm happy to be Josh McCown. More than happy. I'll be Jimmy Clausen. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Uh, welcome in. Uh, John's is feeling under the weather today, so uh, Kevin is filling in, and we send our best to Johnsy, obviously, and hope he's feeling all right. Of course, we have to deliver a few shots when he's not here, as uh, I would expect the same, missing an episode or two. Um, so Kevin's here, and there's uh, plenty to get to. We got your voicemails from the game on uh, on Sunday against the Cardinals, which was about as just apathetic as you could possibly get. I'm not talking about the voicemails. I'm just talking about the game. It's starting to get to that point with the bears. So we're going to do our best to, um, you know, keep things going here. We got to, there's five more games. We'll uh, update the quarterback situation a little bit. Got the voicemails, Matt Schneidman. Uh, we usually do our opponent guest on Thursday, but, uh, we're going to have Schneidman on today looking ahead to Packer week. Um, because I think we're going to have a special guest lined up Thursday. So just a little teaser there. Um, and so we're going to do Schneidman today, talk about the Packers a little bit, and then um, we'll wrap things up with kind of what's at stake in this game and what could potentially happen because we've seen this game before. We've seen it in similar situations before with past head coaches, and it usually doesn't go well. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about all that. You can follow us on Twitter at Adam Hogue, at Kate. Fishbane, you can still uh, follow Johnsy too at Adam Johns. Read Kevin, read Johnsy on the Athletic, theathletic.com slash Hogan Johns, where you go to subscribe uh, and, uh, you know, give us some love by, love by doing that. Get a good deal there. NBCSportsChicago.com, where you can read me. My 10 bear stings are up. Got some, I don't know, I think interesting nuggets. We might circle in on some of that too by the end of this podcast. Um, but quarterbacks, Kevin, Josh McCown, hell? Josh McCown's playing this week. They're, they're calling him back. They're bringing him back. He's going to start. Why not? He, Josh McCown won a game at Lambeau. He did. Uh, you know, they, so um, Mac Jones was wearing the scuba suit yesterday, last night during the what uh, Bill a game Patriots last game. night. That was, that was something else. Can we just, I just, I don't want to mean to go on a rant about Bill Belichick, but was last night not the perfect example of how all Bill Belichick gives a damn about is winning that football game. He doesn't have any agendas. He's not worrying about all this, whatever, like his offense, his defense, like how it looks. All that man cares about is winning the next football game. He does not give a damn what it looks like as long as he gets the W, and that's what the Patriots did last night. I loved it. Do you remember Jonas Gray running back Notre Dame? 
Yes, I do. New England Patriots. Yes. And there was a game, I want to say it was against the Colts, you know, maybe seven, eight years ago. Someone can check me on this. And the Patriots were obviously like a pass, pass, pass team. And then they just decided, you know what? The best way to win this game is to hand it off a hundred times. And Joe's Gray had like the game of his life. Mm-hmm. And no, you know, he had his Brock Forsey game. And, and like that, that was like, to, to me, I remember being like, that's Bill Belichick. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't care. Just going to, although I have said this before, especially since they moved the extra point back. I love teams that go for two at the start of games. Yeah. Because I think it just screws with the opposing head coach from the, a math perspective. You don't know what to do. It totally like, the idea of being down eight nothing is just perplexing for people. Did I love did, it. You, did you hear why they did that though? I did not. I I, so, I assumed at the time it was because of the wind, and then their it, kicker. It had, was though. It was yeah. though. So they decided pregame going in that direction that they were not going to kick the ball if the ball if the line of scrimmage was past the ten. Like that's where they set it. And that's what they stuck with. And obviously, with the extra point these days, kicking from the 15, where the line of scrimmage is the 15, extra point didn't qualify. So, doesn't matter. Going for two then, because in that direction, they scored, and they uh, they they went for two, and they got it. So, you know, like, that's... I, I know all coaches do that, like, set the kicking line, but, like, it's just the amount of preparation that goes into that New England operation. It's so impressive. And so... Somewhere, uh, John Fox is asking someone how to if they can print out Mac Jones's next gen passing chart so he can blow it up and frame it in his home. Yes, three passes, right? Yep, or four. I think it was three. Three. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it was pretty. I, I just appreciate what they did. That's all I'm saying. They found a way to be the biggest threat in their division on the road in ugly conditions. I don't know. With a rookie quarterback, I mean, how do you not just hand it to Bill Belichick? Sorry, I know people don't want to hear that, but that's what, what it is. The scuba suit, by the way, which is how this conversation Sorry. began. Yes, scuba. Bring it all back to our guy, Josh McCown. Scuba Remember Steve! when McCown had one of the greatest games ever for a Bears quarterback against the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah. Um, he told me the story in February when we talked about that game that Jay bought the quarterback, like, kind of heard that that was a thing you should do is get these kind of wetsuits. So Jay got wetsuits for all the quarterbacks to wear that week, and that's what Josh McCown wore in that game. So a wetsuit under the jersey. Yeah. That's interesting. You know, because I was giving Grody, uh, Mark Grody, sidelines for the Bears, a uh, tip on Sunday, which I learned from Northwestern, that when it's cold and rainy, the best thing you can do to keep your feet dry, take, go to the trainer, get an ice bag, and put your feet with your socks on in that ice bag and then tuck the ice bag into the sock so it stays like sealed and then your feet it's it's a it's amazing it, your your feet stay warm and dry cuz the water can't get through the bag so it's like your shoes might get wet but your feet aren't going to get wet don't and your feet get cold no it like it like keeps the heat in too like the huh. the natural heat in your i'm telling you like your feet actually start sweating almost but uh, it, it, it's amazing. It's a little tip I learned from uh, from Northwestern with that nice banner behind you. If you're watching on YouTube, you could see it. Just a smart institution there. Those And apparently, I've heard that that's like a hunter's trick, too. Okay. So, yeah. I don't know if Grody listened to me, but I hope he did. He was bundled up like the Michelin man. <laughs> he was. <laughs> I can't move around like that. If I have that many clothes on, I just like I just stand in place like a statue because I don't feel like I can move. I don't like it. Um, all right. Josh McCown is not starting. I hate to break it to you. Josh McCown is not starting against the Packers this week. The question is, is it Andy Dalton? Is it Justin Fields? Is it Nick Foles? How's everyone doing? This is Nick Foles. Just entered the meeting. I have a hunch Justin's coming back, but that's a hunch. And quite frankly, I had the same hunch last week and that didn't happen. So I don't know. Yeah, I'll, I'll match your hunch with my hunch that, that he is. I, I, I'm of the view Hogue, that if if he's medically cleared, he should play like it, it, to me. It's that simple. Like and if he's in, if there's a shred of doubt medically, then have him sit like i don't i don't know yeah. i don't know if it has to be that that complicated 
Well, I was a little confused by what Nagy said yesterday. Was he saying that he is medically cleared? It's just a pain tolerance issue? I think he said both things. That's why I was confused. Like, yeah, well, I don't know. They they are two different things. Like, medically cleared to me means he can go out there and play without doing any more damage to the injury, right? Right. Yeah. You could still be in pain and have that be the case. In fact, players play through pain all the time. So to me, those are two different things. Um, but Nagy's also saying, so Nagy essentially said, this is a pain tolerance issue. We would never put him out there if he's not medically cleared, um, which I believe. I mean, it would be silly to do to do anything otherwise. But um, I have to say, the limited amount we saw in practice, we do not get to see a lot. But Justin was moving around like last week. Like he was doing things that I would think hurt, would hurt, um, which is why I, I thought he might play last week until I saw like, okay, Dalton's taking the first team reps in practice. So kind of the same deal this week. We'll find out Wednesday who's taking the reps. Uh, Dalton's got this injury to his non-throwing hand. I don't know if that's a problem or not. Probably not a big deal. Um, unless he needs like surgery or something, but uh, well, I guess we'll find that out. Otherwise, it would be Nick Foles, but I don't know. I think Justin Fields probably comes back. Could you imagine, though, if it was Nick Foles? You know what? I am here for the Nick Foles effort game. I, he'd, throw I would, it, he'd throw it 60 times. At this point, why the hell not? I mean, Nagy could just call all the plays, all the passes he wants, just have Foles air it out. I mean, I would be here for that. I, I don't think the result would be any different, but it might be fun to watch. If Nick Foles beats the Packers, <laughs> did the Bears win that trade? <laughs> um, Is he worth the... How, what, what was no. the guaranteed money he got? $27 million? Yeah, maybe that wasn't weird. the guaranteed. Maybe that was the twenty four. Got a lot of he got a lot of million dollars to what did he start five games last year. That a really lot. bad. Back, That's what back it was. Injury. A, a lot of million dollars. A lot of billions. Good. Good for Nick Foles. Yeah. Um, he signed a three year, twenty four million dollar contract. Twenty one million dollars of that guaranteed. Maybe that's why the food in the press box is so bad. Uh, probably not. I actually, actually, Vic. I don't know. Is it just me or Soldier Field just giving up this year? <laughs> Whether it's the food, the turf, the headsets don't work. Like, what's going on in that stadium? The blast. Home the team eight, doesn't. Home team doesn't eight, win games. <laughs> Well, that's normal. The air conditioning's blasting in the middle. It's, you know, it's 30 degrees out. The ACs, that's actually normal, too. It, I, was, I, it was really hot in the press box at the start of the game, and then it got real cold. Like they were trying to freeze us out of there. Yeah. It worked for John Greenberg. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, see what the, uh, we'll see what the HVAC is like in Arlington Heights in a few years. Oh, I can't wait. Cannot wait. All right. Um, let's get your voicemails, then we'll talk about some serious business. And uh we actually have some we do have some serious things to talk about. So uh here are your voicemails, Bears Cardinals Sunday at the crumbling soldier field. Hello? Do you know who this is? Oh, you didn't know? You asked me to call somebody. Hogan John's voicemail. The Hogan John's voicemail line. Believe it or not, George isn't at home. Please leave a message at the beep. Got any questions or comments about the Bears? Give the guys a call before, after, or even during the game. Go Bears! In honor of the 500th episode, I'm calling in early to make a bold prediction. I think the rain destroys Kyler Murray and the Bears win an ugly victory at Soldier Field, which in no. many ways might be the worst result for the franchise as it will create another entire storm about will he or won't he be fired. <sighs> the most Bears thing possible would be a naggy win in an ugly way. <sighs> Let's all prepare for it. Bear down. 
Hey guys, I thought that Justin Fields was washed. I thought that he was a bust. And Andy Dalton is clearly the number one quarterback on this team. I mean, oh my gosh, third and six, interception? Oh, so good. Way to go, Bears. Let's go. Why the f*** do I watch this team week in and week out? Like, can I tune in on a Sunday and not be completely disgusted with what the hell is going on? No. I'd rather not be a fan and just watch real football instead of watching this disgusting shit every single week. It's the end of the first quarter. All I got to say, fire Nagy, fire Pace. By far the best part of this entire game was about spending about 30 seconds watching that fan wrestle with his poncho. That's been about the best offense I've seen all year is this guy fighting through a poncho to try to get the score, and I think he got it. We never went back to him, but I'm hoping he's wearing his poncho now. Can someone explain to me why Nagy did not just go for that on fourth and two in plus territory? You're down 14, not getting the ball after halftime. What's the play? I'm yet to see one Bears game this season without an illegal formation or some random other call. Every single one is a coaching error, and it just doesn't seem to happen to every other team. We have the worst coaches in football. The ruthless, deadly efficiency of Andy Dalton. I mean, three interceptions? Can you argue with that? That's clearly QB1 material. I mean, seriously, Justin who? More like Justin Field? No, Justin Bust. Yeah, Andy Dalton's totally the QB1 on this team. Yeah. Go Bears, fire Nagy. I'm done with this clown. Hey, Hogue. Hey, John. I live in Arizona. This is one of the few games that I get to watch all year on primetime television, and I had to turn this off. This is disgusting. Every single meathead who said Dalton should be starting over field should get a reality check. Fire Nagy. Sell the team. Fire everyone. This is disgusting. God damn it, Hogan Johns, we've f***ed it up again, all right? You know, I'm walking away from the stadium. I'm seeing Soldier. I'm seeing the Field Museum right now. Here's what it is. In, in the freaking Fire face. Nagy. Fire Nagy. Let's go. Fire, Fire Nagy right now. This dude can't coach his way out of a plastic bag. Fire Nagy. Good thing I spent $125 instead of the freezing old brain. Are they serious? Does Nagy really think that the fans don't know he's calling plays? I, what's with the screens on third and 11? What's with Dalton throwing four interceptions when Montgomery's having one of the best games of, of the season? I'm beside myself. I'm, I'm home alone watching this game by myself, and I'm chanting fire Nagy. It's so frustrating. Whatever starts working for them, they give up on it, and then they go to something else. I can't wait to for this team to have new coaches, new leaders, uh, players that actually can catch the ball. I mean, come on, come on, come on, Mooney. What's the deal? I know it's raining, but your season's on the line here. I mean, come on, man. Hey, Hogan John, Josh from Indy. This whole team f***ing blows. You know, Andy Dalton sucks. The only things they should keep are Fields, Mooney, and Roquan. That's it. Bye. Hey, Hogan Johns. Yeah, Johns, you're right. This game was stupid. <clears throat> After that second interception where the receiver falls down and tips the ball for the the defensive Arizona backs and runs it all the way down to what is the 15 yard. I couldn't watch this game anymore. It's ridiculous. It's like I'm watching the Bad News Bears. <sighs> Oh, hey there, boys. It's uh, Robert Dabrowski. Brought in from Soldiers Fields. Uh, just uh, just woke up from uh, quite a, a nice little nap there. Um, I believe it's Monday morning. I kind of fell asleep uh, early on in that game there yesterday. Um, I assume the Bears won. Um, if they didn't, then it was probably the ref's fault. Maybe uh, Coach Nagy's or the other team cheated or some combination of all three. Anyway, uh, who cares? Um, I don't know. going to go back to bed. Somebody uh, give me a call, wake me up, let me know when Justin Fields is playing again. And Otherwise, who cares? All right, go Bears. Oh, hang in there, Robert. 
Oh. Kent, we need to pull that uh, the the Bob saying. Anyways, who cares? That, that that's gotta that's gotta come back. That's good. Um, you know what? Why the f- do I watch this game? The pain is real right now. We get it. We get it. They uh, they f- they find uh, they find interesting ways to lose. Right? It was like a. Yeah, like even when you're expecting them to lose, it's I don't know. Actually, that, did, did anything surprise you Sunday? No. Yeah, I, I don't know. You know, it's just like tight end drops a pass that would yeah. have set up yeah. first and goal and it's returned 70 yards and the you know, fourth down touchdown to DeAndre Hopkins and the James Conner one-handed catch and missed t- It's just like it's a, you know, it's the same result. It's just like a different different reasons and different plays and i yeah. i i get all i get the sentiment of the callers let's put it right. that way. And, and like the one caller i was calling in like very sarcastically saying that andy dalton's clearly the number one qb you know that's a perfect example too like the third play of the game what andy dalton's here to do is to hit a receiver in the flat like not far in stride like that's right that's the positive right he sees the field and can deliver an accurate throw as long as it's not over 20 yards downfield like you know what I mean like that's supposed to be the easy thing that Andy Dalton does and on the third play of the game he can't hit Jakeem Grant in stride and then it goes off his hands and then it's an interception and right there the Cardinals are up seven nothing like that has to be so frustrating and then we talked to Mike Furry yesterday and I asked him because if you look at the all 22 like if Grant catches that ball that play is designed to basically let him make one man miss and there's a lot of open space then. Now, he may get tackled right there. Or he's shifty. He makes the guy miss, and he's off to, running for the races. Like, that's got to, that's just got to, there's so many things that has to be so frustrating. And, like, you def, you can defend the coaches a little bit. Like, make the throw. Cole Komet, make the catch. Like, the players have to make the plays at some point. And, of course, there's a lot of things you blame the coaches for, too, but man, they, like like you said, they always find ways to to make the losing play. That's what they do. That's what they I mean, do. You and I um, both wrote about Dave Montgomery after the game because mm-hmm. he was great in the game. He was great after the game. And I think for those of us that cover the team, it's like I, I just you know, in all due respect to Andy Dalton, like he's not going to be a starting quarterback of this team next year. So it just it doesn't do me a whole lot of good to sit there and analyze his interceptions or try to figure out what he could do better, like. You know, we know who he is and like what his role is on this team. So, to me, what Dave Montgomery said was interesting. I, I, I know you and Johnsy talked about it, but going back to the coaching part of it, Dave Montgomery touched the ball twenty eight times. Yeah, like he, you know, like everyone was like, "Oh, if if Matt Nagy loves Dave Montgomery so much, maybe he should give him the ball." He did. Like they gave Dave Montgomery the ball a lot. They really, really wanted to just run the ball, even when they got down fourteen nothing quickly. And, and and I'll give Dalton credit for this. He did a great job using Montgomery as an outlet in the passing game. And, and I, I asked John D. Phillip about this yesterday. That's something Justin Fields can learn, right? Because someone like Justin Fields probably n- never had a check down to a running back in his high school and college days, at least not very often. And, and now, you know, there are going to be times that he has to, and he has a guy in Montgomery. So I think that's like, again, if you're looking at things to take away from the game, you're happy to have a guy like David Montgomery. But again, like the the play calling, I mean, like they they did what we've kind of all wanted them to do for a couple of years, which is just kind of have a game revolve around him. And it, it didn't matter. I have to say, um somewhere somewhere in our history of whatever we're at now, five oh three episodes, I think I already lost track. Um whenever Matt Nagy went to the or made the decision to go with weekly captains. There's an episode where I question that and raise that as a red flag. Cause that's what Mark Trestman used to do too. And it's just a philosophy. Some coaches believe in that. Some coaches believe in having established captains. I believe in having your leaders very clearly defined from the point the season starts. Like if you want to use training camp to figure that out, sure. But when the season starts, you got to know who the go-to guys are. And to me, if you can't figure that out 
or have your players unanimously, it doesn't even have to be unanimous, unanimously, but like the majority votes to the point where it's obvious who those guys should be. If you don't have that where it's not, ob- then you have a problem. You just have a problem with your roster. You have a problem with your locker room. It should not be hard to figure out who those guys are. The only problem should be is if you have too many of them and you have to pick and choose between like five guys who are who should all be captains, right? But that's not this Bears team. And just throwing Christian Jones out there, and I don't know we're having fun with it, the double defer, throwing Christian Jones out there as your weekly captain because he's playing the Lions or the guys that were out there last week, Demir Bird, because he used to be a Cardinal, and Angelo Blackson, because he used to play for Arizona. What is that doing? I, I hate that. I just do. You then you hear post game, and it's very obvious as a guy is talking not only not just to his teammates, not to his coaches, but just to the media that David Montgomery is that guy, Roquan Smith is that guy. Those are your real leaders. So what are you doing here with this captain nonsense? I just hate it. Speaking of things to pull from this podcast, Kent, you, let's pull that. I think that's the clip we post. That's that. I agree. I'm with you, Hogan. And, and you know, sometimes I say I say to people, look, if if the if the team is playing well, nobody cares who the captains are. But when you're not playing well, and as you said, you have a leadership void, apparently, like why not just give it to the guys who everybody knows the rally around? Speaking of captains, though, my favorite Bears captain story. You remember the 2017 captains? Like we reached like week four. And I think like all of them were on either IR or the bench. <laughs> and those were the season long captains, right? Season long captains. Yeah. It was Mike Glennon, who got yes. benched. Um, no. Qu- Quentin Demps got put on IR. I think he was one of them. Pernell McPhee maybe was uh, injured. There was some moment where Sheriff Manish was the only healthy captain. I mean, it's healthy and playing captain. Although Mike Glennon was great at the coin toss that year. So. And like it would have been fine if Andy Dalton was a captain. I do remember like, Mike Glennon yeah. going out there every week still for the coin toss. It's yeah, it's it's not a good look. And um But again, like you, and you could say, oh well that maybe that's a reason why you don't have season long captain. No, that's part of the problem. Those names you just named, you did not have obvious cat like that's part of what I'm trying to say here is it should not be hard to figure out who those guys are. Like, I know this isn't college or high school football but like you have a group of seniors that you know like okay you have these guys it's the same thing in the nfl they're not seniors but you know who your veterans are you know who like you know who the 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 10 guys are that you can rely on and then you whittle that down to three or four captains if you can't figure that out you have a problem let's go to this week to week nonsense i just do not like it I do enjoy every Friday around noon getting ratioed on Twitter when I tweet out who the captains are. Yeah. Well, this week, uh, Jimmy Graham, obviously, because he played for the Packers. Yeah. By the way, congrats to Jimmy Graham. He's a second year, uh, second year in a row. He's the Bears nominee for Walter Payton Man of the Year. Very well deserved. Um, yeah. I-, I would immediately make the case that he has a, a good chance to win it. Uh, the stuff he does with veterans, the amount of work he does off the field um, with this charity, and and almost the best part of it is you don't really hear a whole lot about it. I mean, he's he's opened up a little bit more about it this year, um, and maybe that's because he was nominated last year and didn't win. And part of it is you kind of do need the promotion, you do need people to know, um, and part of that's on us too. So, um, you know, as we get closer. I'll make that a pledge right here on this podcast. We get closer to the Walter Payton Man of the Year award being announced. We will tell you more about what Jimmy Graham is doing and try to tell those stories because it's important. And quite frankly, he deserves it regardless of you know his contract or what's happening on the field. It's uh, amazing stuff that Jimmy Graham's doing. So congrats to him. All the nominees for all 32 teams came out this morning. And uh, that is the winner will be announced at the NFL Honors in Los Angeles at the Super Bowl. So, I might find out if Devin Hester gets in the Hall of Fame that day, too. Could actually be a good day for the Bears. We're all trying to eat better, but when things are busy, like during football season, that could be hard, especially breakfast. You're trying to get the kids out of the house. You got all kinds of things going on. Everything, Everybody's in a rush. 
but healthy breakfast doesn't have to be boring or hard to do. Magic Spoon has the amazing flavors you love, but without all the bad stuff. Zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. There's only 140 calories a serving. Keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and low-carb, all of that stuff. And you build your own box. Very easy to do. You got amazing flavors to choose from. Cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, blueberry, cinnamon, cookies and cream, and maple waffle. And as I've been telling you, cookies and cream and maple waffle, they're so good. They're so popular. They are now back permanently. So go to magicspoon.com slash Adam to grab a custom bundle of cereal and try it today. Be sure to use our promo code Adam at checkout to save $5 off your order. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product. It's back with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. Remember to get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash Adam. Use the promo code Adam to save $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. After years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by big wireless providers, if we've learned anything, it's that there's always a catch. So when I first heard that Mint Mobile offers premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month, I thought, what's the catch? But after speaking with them and using their service, it all made sense. There isn't one. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they're the first company to sell wireless service online only. So by cutting out retail stores, there's no crazy overhead costs that get passed down to you in the form of mystery fees. Instead, Mint just passes on sweet savings direct to you. When I found out how much money you could save by switching to Mint Mobile, I got excited. For people, People looking for extra savings, Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month. All plans come with unlimited talk and text and high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. And you can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan. Keep your same phone number along with all of your contacts. And if you're not 100% satisfied, Mint Mobile has you covered with their seven-day money-back guarantee. Switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to you your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash Hogue. That's mintmobile.com slash Hogue, H-O-G-E. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash Hogue. In sports radio these days, there's so many choices when it comes to who to listen to when making your picks. If you missed the biggest sports headlines from the night before, have you ever wondered how that might impact this week's biggest bets? Relive the best in sports from the night before with BetMGM Tonight. Presented by BetMGM. We here at Team Hogan Johns trust BetMGM with all of our picks. And listening to BetMGM tonight has made that so much easier. Make sure we're up to date on all the latest lines. And honestly, after listening to it, we felt better informed and more confident about making our picks. And that's always good. Plus, let's be honest. Picks are just fun. BetMGM tonight is fun. It's high energy. It's your live destinations for both casual and hardcore sports fans alike. Hosts Quentin Mayo... Ryan Horvat and Trista Crick are joined by on-site correspondents to bring you the latest insider information in real time. Every detail matters when making bets. BetMGM Tonight dives deeper to help you get the edge. It's fun to bet on the game, but it's even more fun when you've got the inside scoop. Tune in to BetMGM Tonight, presented by BetMGM. Listen on Odyssey, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. That's BetMGM Tonight on Odyssey, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Hey, you've probably heard of Masterclass, but what exactly is it? With Masterclass, you can learn from the world's best minds anytime, anywhere, at your own pace. A few examples. You can learn how to play poker from Phil Ivey. You can learn how to cook with Gordon Ramsay. Or you can even learn some basketball skills from Steph Curry. With over 100 classes from a range of world-class instructors, that thing you've always wanted to do is closer than you think. I've been checking out a couple of these classes. You may know this already, but I tend to dabble in the ukulele a little bit in the off-season, and there's a ukulele class on there, and I was blown away by some of the details and things I'd never really thought of or done because I've never really had a professional 
class that I've taken to play ukulele on there, but it's right there on Masterclass and just little things like that. If you've ever wanted to try it, or if you're already doing something, you want to get better at it, you just check out masterclass.com. This holiday, you can give one annual membership and get one free just by going to masterclass.com slash first down today. That's masterclass.com slash first down. Again, give one annual membership, get one free at masterclass.com slash first down. Terms apply. Um, all right, let's get to uh, this week. The Green Bay Packers, you have heard of them. Go Bears. Aaron Rodgers has had a, quite a season uh, for many different reasons, and he has a uh, poor little pinky toe. He does. Matt Schneidman covers the pinky toe uh, for The Athletic, and uh, let's bring him into the podcast now. All right, let's bring in our guy, Matt Schneidman, who covers the Green Bay Packers for The Athletic. You've heard him before on the podcast. Matt, what's going on? Appreciate you coming on again. How are we doing? It's always a pleasure, Packers Bears Week. The best part of it is always getting to come on this show, so happy to be at this time of the year again. Well, uh, yeah, I was trying to think of some joke there about Packers Bears, but I couldn't come up with one. I think the point is that we all just kind of know what's going to happen this week, and you just play out the week, right? <laughs> I don't know. Listen, if anything, this team that I cover has been less than predictable in the past seven months or whatever. So nothing would surprise me on Sunday. Sure. I expect the Packers to win and win pretty convincingly, but listen, I I've seen wilder stuff, especially in the last couple of weeks when I saw a bare foot on a zoom call. So I would not be surprised by anything. That, um, that was, you've, yeah, you've had quite the month there in uh, covering the Packers, Matt. I was thinking about this in terms of like, if anything could make the game interesting, which is, do you think, like, and I understand this question might not be answerable because nobody really knows, but do you think the Packers, like that Saints game, like that, that obviously was an anomaly, but like, they don't have that in them again. Like, do you like, is there anything you sense that like they could maybe have a dud at some point? The rest of the way. Yeah, I was talking about this with some of the other beat writers here yesterday, actually. Like the last two years, Packers season has obviously ended in the same fashion in the NFC title game. Two years ago, they lost to the 49ers in Santa Clara, 37 to 8 in week 12, and then got their teeth kicked in in the NFC title game, 37 20. Last year, they lost to the Buccaneers, 38 10 in week six in Tampa and then lost in the NFC championship game. So the common theme of those years has been the Packers kind of have that dud against an elite team in the middle of the season where they never show up. They handle their business against everybody else. But going into that NFC title game, there's that clear gap between whoever they're playing and them, even though they were the one seed last year, the Buccaneers were clearly better. Um, I don't think they have that in them this year. I think that dud is, is out the window. I don't think it would come against the Bears anyway. Um, they don't play the Buccaneers. They already beat the Cardinals this year. So I don't think they're capable of that. It, we've kind of been waiting for that, waiting for that performance of, all right, they just didn't show up, but it hasn't come. And I think that's why this year's Packers team is better equipped to to make the Super Bowl because they don't seem to have that, that letdown in them. Yeah, I think that maybe if, that had happened against Arizona earlier in the year in that Thursday night game, but that's not what happened. The Packers went in there and won. So um, I agree with you on that. You know what I think? I think what's got to be, um, I don't know if the word's insulting, but like just really defeating for the Chicago Bears right now is when Aaron Rodgers in your own south end zone at Soldier Field declares to the fan base that he owns them. And I don't sense any type of like bulletin board material from that. You know what I mean? Like it, it doesn't, it, I, I don't know if that's like privately a thing, but like I, I don't, you would think that that would piss the bears off. And here's the other sad part. Even if it does, what are they going to do about it? Like that's sort of the, the, 
where this rivalry is at right now and probably why Aaron Rodgers pro- has no regret over doing what he did at Soldier Field earlier this season. Yeah, that's a good point. And we saw an extremely soft football team play last night uh, in the Buffalo Bills. And I, I'm not you know, accusing the Bears of being this, but I think it would make the game interesting if they do kind of come out and fight back, not against that, but, you know, the head, and I want to get your guys' opinion on this in a little bit, but the head coach and GM, their jobs could very well be on the line this Sunday night. And let's see how much the Bears want to play for them and play for those guys that have that have given them jobs and stuff like that. It's going to be tough, obviously, without Khalil Mack. Um, if there's one weakness that the Packers offense has had the last couple of years, it's when their starting tackles are out and – that's why they lost to the Buccaneers last year. It's why they, they've struggled at times without David Bakhtiari. I don't know if he's going to play on Sunday. I would assume he doesn't. But if they can't get pressure on, on Aaron Rodgers, and even if they can, it, he's proven capable of, of beating them. I mean, the Rams have probably the best defensive line in football, and, and the Packers just went and put up 36 points on the Rams. Granted, six of that came on a pick six. But um, – that's really the only way I could see the bears making this game interesting and, and showing some of that grit and some of that fight back is really getting pressure on Rogers. But I don't see a scenario in, in which that really affects the Packers offense on Sunday night. Hogue, maybe somebody should uh, concoct a Matt Nagy's been fired already story to uh, <laughs> this week. And that could seem to kind of rally the bears against the winless lions. So uh, the opponent, uh, uh, just the opponents a little different. Yeah. Just they almost yeah. lost that game too, but right. They need to uh, walk off field goal to beat the lions. Yeah. Uh, alas, uh, Matt, uh, you had a great feature, uh, a week or two ago on Devonte Adams that folks should go check out. And I assume that we'll see Jalen Johnson shadowing him again. Uh, it didn't work so well on like two big plays. Everything else seemed to be okay. I'm just curious what, with what you know about Devonte Adams, how does he? How does he view you? Think a matchup like that, and Rogers too, because Jalen Johnson's become a good corner, but he's also in his second year. Is that one when, when they see a guy shadowing him like that? Is that one where like we know that we're better and we're just going to keep we're going to keep targeting, or is Rogers going to say, you know what, go ahead and shadow him and and we'll pick our spots and I'll just attack all the other weak corners on this team? Yeah, it's interesting because Devontae Adams is by far and away the best player to uh, interview, work with reporters. He's runaway winner for our, whatever it's called, the media good guy of the year award. But the one thing he pushes back on when we ask him is about specific players who guard him. And for years, and this is only my third year covering the team, but, and I've learned this so far is Devante does not study specific players. He doesn't care if Jalen Ramsey's guarding him. He doesn't care if Jalen Johnson's guarding him. He just studies film and prepares for the scheme as a whole. So if you ask him, I remember I asked him last year when they were playing the Colts, you know, do you draw on some of your reps against Xavier Rhodes when he was on the Vikings going into this matchup? And he was like, I honestly don't care who's, who's guarding me. I prepare for the scheme. Doesn't matter about the player. So I don't think that matters to him. If Jalen Johnson shadows him, Aaron Rodgers knows that because Aaron Rodgers loves picking on, on young cornerbacks. Jalen Johnson, you know, could be a future star in this league. We saw what he did to Devontae in week six, I think it was. And that's about as good as you're going to get. Four catches for, I believe it was 98 yards and no touchdowns. Um, If you get Devontae Adams to have only four catches in a game, that's pretty darn good. And, And they still haven't found that consistent number two threat. You know, there's a little bit of MVS here and there, a little bit of Alan Lazard. AJ Dillon's become more of a an option in the passing game. Aaron Jones, obviously, with his knee a lot healthier. But I think Jalen Johnson can do a good job. And and obviously, as we saw in that first matchup, there's going to be a lot of safety help over the top. So the Bears probably better than anyone have figured out how to limit Devontae Adams as much as another team possibly can. And I guarantee you, looking back on that matchup he and Aaron Rodgers are going to have some ways they devise to get him more open. All right, let's talk about the Packers quarterback situation uh, this week. I am uh, shocked, just shocked that Aaron Rodgers has managed to make a uh, a broken pinky toe 
uh, into the drama it has become with the attention that has come with it. Um, and thank you for putting that toe in my uh, Twitter timeline the way he did. Um, of course, he'll probably blame the media for that, not him, since even though he's the one who stuck his foot up uh, in front of the microphone. So he's going to play Sunday. There's no question about that. What what does that mean, though, if he's limited at all in practice? What do you expect? Because now Jordan Love is on the COVID list. They got Kurt Benkert, right? Uh, mm-hmm. The practice squad quarterback. I would think that they're probably going to sign Blake Bortles again if to be the backup. But like, what does this mean for how the hell the Bears are going to run or the uh, Packers are going to run their practice this week preparing for the Bears? Yeah, they're, they're kind of familiar with this. Aaron Rodgers hasn't gotten a full work of practice and practice of work. And I should say since week seven against Washington, because the next week they had the Thursday night game. So it was all walkthroughs. The next week was week nine. He tested positive for COVID. Then coming off of that, he had his toe and he hasn't really practiced. I think he had one, one or two walkthroughs in there. So they're kind of used to this. Um, it hasn't really affected him because the two games he's really played on the toe were against the Vikings when they put up 31 points. And then last week against the Rams, when, uh, the offense put up 29 minus the pick six. Um, so it hasn't really affected him. Every time we ask anyone about it, whether it be offensive coordinator, Nathaniel Hackett, Luke Getzey, the quarterback coach, LaFleur, Rogers, um, they say, if anyone can work through a game plan during the week without practice and execute it. It's Aaron Rodgers. So there doesn't seem to be much worry. I am fascinated to see how they do handle those practice reps because there are still receivers and running backs who need to get their reps. And as you mentioned, Jordan Love tested positive for COVID yesterday, ended up on that list. Kurt Benkert, who recently tested positive for COVID, just like Aaron Rodgers, um, may be the only quarterback practicing this week. And the reason Aaron Rodgers and Kurt Benkert can't be deemed high risk, close contacts. I don't know if they had meetings yesterday, quarterback meetings, um, cause they're coming off the bye week So if they were close together, they can't be deemed high risk, close contacts because both Benkert and Rodgers are still in that 90 day grace period where they don't have to test for COVID after they tested positive. So they're both good to go. I do expect Blake Bortles to get another call off the golf course this week just to handle some practice reps and possibly be that number two guy on Sunday like he was against the Chiefs a couple weeks ago. But it'll be interesting. It, it Can Devontae Adams get his regular week of work in and, and be prepared for Sunday's game with Kurt Benkert throwing him the ball? I think so. I, I don't think it should be too much of a problem. Kurt Benkert throws a really nice ball, um, a better one than Jordan Love, to be honest with you. So... I don't think it should affect too much, um, just like it didn't against the Rams last week when they were in a similar situation. I think we have our headline for the podcast. Kurt Benkert <laughs> throws a better ball than Jordan Love. Oh, I've tweeted that many times during <laughs> the offseason. I like hey, it. Hey, that, uh, d- that's an ongoing storyline here on the Hogan Johns <laughs> podcast. So I, I, I think our listeners will love to hear that about Jordan Love. Go ahead, Kev. Hey, Matt, um, I want to ask you about uh, Adrian Amos. And I know we've asked you about him over the past couple of years since that, you know, he moved to the Packers, but it just seems like he's just continued to be a steady player, which is what he was in Chicago. I'm curious. And he also, it seems like he's becoming Green Bay, somebody who has talked to the media a lot, um, something he didn't, he was a little quieter here when he was, you know, in, in his younger days. And uh, what, I'm just curious your, your impressions of him all the, uh, on and off the field and kind of what he's he's meant to that team since that big signing. Yeah, like you said, and, and you guys know this better than anyone, he's just a guy who doesn't make big mistakes. He might not always make the flashy play, but he will rarely screw up big time. And, and that's what he's been again this year. He's stout against the run. He's really good in pass coverage. And the more interesting part, maybe from from our perspective as reporters, is like you said, he's kind of the spokesman for the defense. Whenever they need just the defensive player to talk about the general state of the defense, or they need a defensive player to go out there after a bad loss, like after they lost to the saints, 38, three, he was there, you know, last year on zoom, he talked uh, like those one days a week for Aaron Rodgers, Devonte Adams, like the star players get that set one day a week treatment where, you know, they're going to talk. Adrian Amos talked every Thursday last week. Like he was that guy. And 
this year, he's actually become a lot better, a lot more insightful, open at the podium. Um, granted, nothing's ever the same as locker room, but he's been a great quote this year. And last year over Zoom, it was eh, it was kind of more just the surface level stuff. But I always respect a guy who makes himself available, especially after losses. This year, it's been that plus a little more insight into him in the defense. And obviously, it helps when Packers have a top five defense in the league. And he's obviously a big part of that. All right, Matt, I'd ask you to make a prediction, but I'm gonna, instead I'm going to ask you how many points the Packers win by. I'm going to go 13. <clears throat> the spread, I believe, is 13. So I'm not going to tell you to pick one side or the other because <laughs> I don't want to be on the hook for anyone losing their rent money this month. Um, Come on, have a take. <laughs> All right, Packers win <laughs> by 17. I'll say they cover 13 and a half. Listen, we'll know a lot about what's at stake in this matchup going into it, because if the Vikings lose to the Steelers on Thursday night, the Packers clinch the NFC North with a win on Sunday night. And if that happens, I think they'll go balls to the wall to try and clinch this division with four games to go. Obviously, they still would have a lot to play after that in terms of number one seed, but the North is is the first thing that matters to them. And I think they... They put their foot on the gas, all gas, no break, as Matt LaFleur loves to say, and win this one. I'll go, let's see, 31-14 in that situation. I'll go 31-14. That's an interesting point, too, about the uh, North potentially being able to be clinched in the game um, because the Bears did that against the Packers a few years ago, and I have to imagine that uh, Aaron Rodgers has probably not forgotten that. No, and then the Packers did it against the Bears last year, I believe. They did it against the Vikings two years ago, then against the Bears at Lambeau last year, I believe. Was it that game where – was it Jesper Horstead who – the That was lateral, two years ago. That was two years ago. Okay. I, yeah, I, I know I'm, what you're talking I'm getting about. getting all my games yeah. mixed up. The lateral at the very end of the game. I forget, but I think it was against the Bears last year, if I'm not mistaken. I forget. It's all it it's be. all crumpled it together be. for me. Yeah. Um, anyway, Matt, we appreciate the time. Thanks so much. And uh, we'll see you Sunday in Green Bay. Appreciate you guys as always. See you soon. Okay, Kevin. So you heard what could possibly be at stake for the Packers this week uh, with potentially winning the NFC North against the Bears. I, you know, I I led my 10 Bears things up. You, you know this. You covered... Mark Tressman, you covered John Fox. Am I putting too much stock in what those final losses to the Packers meant? Um, because the way I always viewed those was those two games in particular were like the games that sealed their fate. So in 2014, it was that infamous 55 to 14 loss where the Bears were down 42 to nothing at halftime. Um, and I put it in my story, which I don't have in front of me, but the Packers scored four second quarter touchdowns, like 73 yards, 54 yards, 30 something yards, and then like 18 yards. Like it was just an embarrassment. And that was when Mark Tressman infamously told his players at halftime that they weren't a good football team. No kidding. Um, but talk about rah rah halftime speeches. There you go. So that was bad. And I always had the vision. I remember looking down from the press box at the Bears' sideline and Mark standing there like at midfield and nobody is within 15 yards of him. Like everybody was like, not, not part of this. You know, like it was just a weird image. And I think at that point we knew what was going to happen at the end of the season. Uh, even though that was more like early November, early to mid-November. This game's a little bit later. Then in 2017, you had the John Fox game where he infamously challenged the uh, play at the goal line with Benny Cunningham, thinking he reached for the pylon and touched the pylon with the football, when in reality, Benny Cunningham lost the ball before he hit the pylon, which is a touchback and a turnover, giving the ball to the Packers. So John Fox essentially challenged a play that resulted in the other team getting the football. Amazing. Just amazing stuff. And that was, I remember writing after that game that, again, that kind of 
seal John Fox's fate. So the question is, Kevin Fishbane, is there a scenario that plays out Sunday in Green Bay where uh, the McCaskey family says we've had enough and for the first time ever, they make some in-season changes by Monday? You know, I always think back to that Mark Trestman game because like, if they didn't do it then, what could possibly happen to do it in any other scenario? I mean, that was yeah. just right there. Like, they did something that week that you had to go back to, I think, like the 1922 Bears, some of, you know, lo- giving up 50 points in back to back games. They had a bye after they got just demolished by the Patriots. Like, they came off a bye entering that game in Green Bay. Like, it was just no excuse for that. This one, I don't know. I, I think that the the biggest difference you would think, and who knows what's going on in that building and how things have changed in the past few weeks, you think there's less animosity between ownership and the guys who are running the team. I think that's like there's always just been this feeling of mutual respect. Um, but it, look, if, if but do if you think that respect is still there after what happened two weeks ago? Because at a yeah, bare minimum, the organization hung Matt Nagy out to dry. Yeah, I guess, you know, maybe Matt Nagy might not have as as much respect for his bosses, but I I don't know. I think you'd have to see them lose in an embarrassing fashion. But what you really would be looking for is, is there a sense that the players just are not playing hard? Because, you know, and I, I hate to talk about effort. I hate it because it's so hard for us to tell. And these guys are, are taking part in a car crash every week for their, you know, this is their job. You watch that Cardinals game, you could tell how much they were, you know, they were fighting in that game. And I mean, you take like, out the four turnovers the Bears are in the game. I, like, I mean, I, I know fans can't stand Eddie Jackson, but the way he was flying to try to prevent the touchdown near the end of the game, and you could see how much he wanted to win that game. Um, I I don't th- and, and the offense the way they were celebrating just to to get the game within ten. Like I don't think that they're at the point that they were in twenty fourteen. You know, twenty seventeen was weird because that was just such a like everybody knew, and there were yeah. so many young players in that team. It's just you know this is an interesting mix because you got the veterans. You also have so many stars who are out. Like this team that they're trying out there is just. You know, you no know Khalil Mack, no Al Robinson, no Akeem Hicks. This is my long way of saying, I always say that. I mean, we all know anything can happen. And we all know this rivalry means everything to the McCaskies. And to get embarrassed on national TV and you do have an extra day heading into the following week. Yeah, before the Monday Nighter. Yeah, you have you have an opportunity if you want to do it and you want to get, you know. But I, I'll, I'll say this, because I almost, I almost said you can get your head start. But... I've said this since the past kind of two months. They don't need to fire Matt Nagy in season to get a head start in the coaching search. Like if George McCaskey's doing his job, he already has a Rolodex of names. He has already talked to people in the league and is doing his due diligence and doing his research. So figure out what his plan is. He doesn't need to fire Matt Nagy to do that. He can do official interviews and that, that stands for something. He can do those interviews now in season, but Getting, being the first one to hire a head coach doesn't necessarily mean you hired the best head coach either. No, it doesn't. But I think that um, I think there's a couple things there. One is still though there's still a level of respect. So you just brought that up, the respect. Well, if you respect the guy, then don't go behind his back, interviewing in that formal interviews, but you know poking around about his replacement while he's still the head coach. Like that's not respectful. So it. And it also doesn't sound like how the McCaskies would do business, too. So, well, maybe they will. I mean, because I'm with you on that. Like, that's how a real NFL organization uh, would operate. It's cutthroat. It's how freaking college football works now. Look at what's going on in Miami. It was ridiculous. You know, and and, and, and I'm not condoning that at all. I think that it's not great, but... Um, and, and then you brought up 2014, and I agree with you. Like, man, if you didn't fire Mark Tressman with not only like that, those back-to-back losses to the Patriots and the Packers were just the start. 
Look at everything that unfolded from there. And he survived all of that to the last day. Now, was that part of, was that partly because Phil Emery wasn't going to fire the guy? Maybe. But then maybe you should have let them both go. And I think it's a fair question right now. Like, is Ryan Pace going to fire Matt Nagy? Probably not. But shouldn't an organization learn from 2014? Like, I don't necessarily think all that drama is going to play out again. But I understand the, oh, if they didn't do it then, why would they do it now? Well, man, I would hope I learned from how the rest of that season unfolded and all the nonsense. Jimmy Clausen starting a football game over Jay Cutler for no reason. Like, think about all that. So... I I just I I I don't know is the answer to the question. Like I don't know what's going to happen Sunday. Well, I kind of know what's going to happen Sunday night. I don't know what's going to how it's going to affect what happens Monday. Um, but I do think it's worth bringing up in the context of the past two head coaches and their final loss to the Green Bay Packers. And you know it's interesting too because you just try to do you just tried to use logic when talking about the Bears front office. Sorry. Which it just it, it, you you hit it on the head like it. This is what they did in 2014. We all saw what happened. So like, why wouldn't you change things up? I think what's 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 interesting is this entire conversation we're having. We're having this because we know how likely it is that they get embarrassed on national television, right? Like yeah, we wouldn't be. They don't just lose, but it looks bad. It looks yeah. bad, and, and, and we we saw what happened in non primetime games this year in Tampa, in Cleveland. Okay, then you go to the opener in L.A. You go back to the Packers primetime game last year, and what that happened in the first half there. Like the problem out. is the only reason we're having we can have this discussion of could this be it is because this team has had games like this against the Packers, against other teams on primetime TV, which goes to the reason that, like, that's the reason we have to have this conversation because we know, unfortunately, what this team is capable of in that regard. And and, and you know who's on the other side. But I will posit this to you, Mr. Hoke. And I got oh, laughed oh. at on the score for bringing this up. But well, I, 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 Yeah, I heard it. Yeah, heard Dan, Ber- Dan Bernstein wasn't hearing any of this. No, I just think, again... I like no. to see. I like. I think it's funny no. to think about the pretzel no. that would be formed in the mind of a George McCaskey if Justin Fields goes out there, at Lambeau Field, throws for three hundred yards, four no. touchdowns. No. The Bears pull a twenty fifteen Thanksgiving on Aaron Rodgers. They win in Green Bay. Then what? Uh, probably not. Isn't uh, it fun to consider the scenario, though? The only thing that was fun of considering there was the pretzel living in George McCaskey's brain. <laughs> I just, I think it just, it, it, and it, here's the problem. I'll go back to what I said earlier. You can't even conceive of what I just described. They've given you no reason to think that is possible at all. So it's worth laughing at. But I also think it's... I think we haven't won enough under the leadership of George McCaskey, and that's what we're working on. Mm -hmm. Curious to see uh, how they're going to try to fix that. So if... One one more thing, actually, before we get to George and Ted. Um, Just like logistically... Should the most important thing about Matt, what Matt, like firing this guy right now or not firing him, shouldn't it all be about like the interview process and who you're bringing in? Like going back to the idea of like doing your homework behind the scenes, why not get first in line? And, I, and you're right, it doesn't guarantee you anything. But like, for example, I, I think even though he got fired the other day, I would imagine Joe Brady's going to get some head coaching interviews because he got a bunch last year. And I don't necessarily know what's going on right now in Carolina. It doesn't sound great. Was there an issue with Cam Newton? What's going on with the, that owner? I, I don't know. But if Joe Brady's going to get some head coaching interviews, why not knock that out now? He's he's unemployed. 
You know what I mean? I like think, you can get ahead yeah. of the game. Elim- and then maybe that just involves eliminating him. Maybe you interview him, you don't like it. Fine. What about um, you know, the guy I've been talking about, Ryan Day? Maybe Ryan Day has no interest in coming to the Bears. I wouldn't blame him one bit. But his team's not playing in the college football playoff. Playing in the Rose Bowl. He's got some time on his hands right now. Why not get ahead of that? He's a college head coach. You can interview him. I think I'm so ingrained in the fact that they're not going to fire him in season that I've convinced myself of these reasons why it doesn't necessarily benefit them to do that. So I'm like, I'm looking at that other side because like, I, you, you're right. And if it's week 16, week seven, or you can start these interviews in week 17, you want to get on the phone with a Josh McDaniels before he's got a playoff game and he can't talk to you. Right, you want to get on the phone with with some of these guys if you can and get get that going. Um, you know, I don't know how this factors in. There's not going to be as many teams, you know, think going for head coaches this year. I just remember, you know, when the Bears the when the Bears hired Matt Nagy at the time, you know, the timing was so interesting, right? Because if they if the Chiefs win that game, Matt Nagy's probably not the Bears head coach. Yeah. Right. Well, and if, if and if John Fox doesn't lose in 2015 playoffs, then he's probably not the Bears head coach. If the Bears beat the Eagles, Vic Fangio is not the Broncos head coach. So like all these things, like it's just a strange thing. And, and if you get started before the season ends, maybe you can kind of eliminate some of that. On the flip side, and I understand that Kyle Shanahan is not the Kyle Shanahan he was a couple of years ago, but it it, it kind of worked out okay for the 49ers to have to wait. But and they still kinda, interviewed them when they could. Right. But you know, it, and, and, and it, I think part of this new rules rule is to get these guys the interviews out of the way before the playoffs start so they can concentrate on the playoffs and not have the distraction of having to deal with a job interview in the middle of preparing for a playoff game. Am I wrong? I mean, I'm thinking that's why they're doing this. Oh, no, for sure. I just like yeah. I'm trying to think of how yes, th- th- there's all these benefits to it. I just think, you know, the Colts hiring Frank Reich when they did. You know, like like you can still, you don't have to be first. You you just have to find the right guy. But as you said, the right guy, you might need to interview him in December if you have that opportunity to do so. Well, and you are already competing with the Raiders. Like the Raiders have an interim head coach right right now, and you think they're sitting on their hands, waiting waiting for January? I, I doubt it. I think they're they're probably doing. Doing their work. I mean, the the last coach they gave a hundred million dollars over ten years. Turned out to be a stupid hire, but they got aggressive. So, and I, that's the one concern I have about this whole deal too. You see this money getting thrown around in college right now. Like, how much are you gonna have to pay? So, I don't know. All right. Um. Last point on this, since all the talks about Matt Nagy. If Matt Nagy's record against the Packers, which is one in six, matters so much, and it mattered for John Fox, and it mattered for Mark Tressman, and it mattered for Lovey Smith when he stopped beating the Packers. For a while there, he went he went through a stretch where he was 7-3 and three against Green Bay. That's the only good stretch the Bears have had in the last three decades against this team. But once he started losing to them, part of the reason why he was out after going 10-6 and six in 2012. Well, then shouldn't these records matter too? George McCaskey, 3-18. and 18. That's the Bears' record since George McCaskey took over as chairman. Ted Phillips, 13-33. and 33. That's the Bears' record against the Packers since Ted Phillips took over as team president in 1999. Like, at what point is this organization going to realize that it is not just the head coach? It is not just the GM. The Packers are not just a better organization than the Bears because they've had great quarterback luck. It has to do with the people that were hired in those positions to create that quarterback luck and put them in this position to be a good team over the last three decades and continually beat the Bears. So, to quote my guy Mark Silverman, it starts at the top, right? It does, and... 
you know, listen, the person who's in charge of hiring the GM, the GM picks the quarterback, the GM picks the head coach, the head coach coaches the quarterback, and this is where the Bears are at. And every decision, everything that has led to the Bears to this moment can be always pointed back to the two people who made those decisions. So, yeah, I, like to me, it is what's going to change. What is if we're going to be approaching a head coaching search, a GM search, what have you, how is it going to be different? And I'm very curious. I don't have high expectations, but I'm very curious to see. Uh, and maybe they won't tell us. I don't know. But they, they're, they, well, while maybe it would be disrespectful to start digging on potential future head coaches, there's no reason that the chairman should not be forming a plan as to how to attack this and how to make sure that they get this right the next time and you know what Hogue, they might not like they might the next head coach and gm could not work too like it it, it, it can be a crapshoot but you have to figure out the process at which they're going about this isn't working and it hasn't worked yeah. so they have to change the process at, at what they do well, speaking of processes, um, last final point I want to bring up. Did you did you see my uh, Brashad Perriman nugget in the uh, in my Ten Bears thing by any chance? I did not. That's okay. So I couldn't help but notice Sunday. You know, Brashad Perriman is now on the uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He was inactive for the Bears. They claimed him off waivers, which bumped the Rod- Rodney Adams to the practice squad right at the beginning of the season. He was inactive for eight games. Okay, Bears did not, in their defense, did not have a lot of wide receiver injuries in the first eight games. Um, but they made it also very clear, and Mike Furry said the same thing yesterday, that part of it was Brashad Perriman getting the playbook down, right? Okay, so they released Brashad Perriman on November 7th, the day before the Steelers game, which was when David Montgomery came off of IR. That was the move that was made to get David Montgomery back. The next day, and this is just the Bears' luck this season and how the season has gone, Allen Robinson hurts his hamstring and misses three straight games after that. Of course, Perriman, if you just look at him as a wide receiver, he seemed like he was an insurance policy, specifically if Allen Robinson got hurt, like for that position with that build that he has. And um, Okay, so that's just bad timing. But after being inactive for eight straight games, Perriman was dressed in uniform for the Buccaneers seven days later. And I couldn't help but notice Sunday, he played 84% of the offensive snaps for the Bucs. As their very obvious wide receiver three behind Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. Now, let me be very clear, and this is getting some confusion on Twitter because of people who don't actually click on the link and read what I wrote to just react to the tweet. This is not at all an argument that Brashad Perriman is a good wide receiver, nor is it an argument that he should still be on the Bears. But doesn't it at least make you question how a guy apparently struggled to learn the Bears system but could be in uniform for the Super Bowl champion seven days later and a couple weeks after that playing 84% of the snaps. Doesn't seem to be a problem in Tampa. And again, I understand he's not actually playing that well. He had one catch on three targets for five yards. This is not an argument that Prashad Perriman's any good. But you don't think Tom Brady has some say over which of his wide receivers are active on game day? Like, there must be something to him being able to play 84% of the snaps. And I think he dropped a touchdown last week against the Giants too, or two weeks ago, whatever. I don't. Did it at least like raise a red flag to you, or make you question that at all? Since 2018, the Bears have successfully developed one wide receiver, Darnell Mooney. Yes, they have a good one, Al Robinson. But mm-hmm. I don't. I don't necessarily. I don't know how much credit I give them for. He was already good when he got here. He was already good when he got here. And and his production was great in 2019 and 2020. And when he was healthy in 2018. And you got to wonder why it hasn't been this year. Yeah. Before he got but hurt. The, but the Bears have one guy. And 
and and Mooney's a great story, and I think he's going to be a good receiver in this league for a long time. But Taylor Gabriel didn't work out. Anthony Miller didn't work out. Javon Wims didn't work out. They couldn't figure out anything with Kevin White. Again, not not their fault necessarily there. Daz Newsom's on the practice squad. Riley Ridley did not work out after they were so excited. They thought that was the, the steal of the draft. Couldn't get anything out of him. Um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a staff that just hasn't uh, hasn't been able to figure out that position, and it's and kind I of get, an important position. And I guess part of it too is like, okay, so one is the playbook issue. I guess is like, how can a guy not understand the Bears playbook, but then go to Tampa and be able to play right away, whether he's playing well or not? Like again, that's not the point. But part of it too is like. Didn't, wouldn't you be sitting there and being like, well, maybe we should have activated him one week to see what he could do? But no, also, you had Demir Bird and you had Marquise Goodwin. You got to have them out there every week. Like I, I, And I don't necessarily think Perriman's that good, but you must have thought he was good if you claimed him off of waivers. I just don't understand, I guess, the logic. I, and, and you know what? I don't like the playbook argument either. Figure it out. Yeah. Figure out a way to make this guy work in your system. Don't the Bucks make are doing them, it. Yeah, don't make like and and I listen like the way we've seen Anthony Miller bounce around this year, I think tells you about the challenges other teams have had to harness his skill set. So this isn't maybe fully on the Bears, but that was always what they would bring up: the playbook. You know what you got when you drafted him. He was somebody that dominated one-on-one coverage. And did whatever he wanted to corners who covered him in college. So find a way to make that fit in your offense. You claim Brashad Perriman. You saw what he did in his career. If he can't understand, or if he can't grasp what you want from him to do, then do something different. Do something different with him so that he can figure it out. I, I, the, the playbook stuff, it's just like the, the best coaches take a talented guy and, and, and adapt to what he does best. They don't make them adapt to your playbook. And I think that's just what, like, Darnell Mooney has transcended that, obviously. And good for him. And he's, you know, he's been a phenomenal player and, and is everything they wanted there. But the fact that they couldn't get anybody else to do anything at that position besides Darnell Mooney and Al Robinson in four seasons just tells you a lot about the, the, how, you know, frankly, how broken this offense has been. Yeah. So, anyway. By the I mean, way, they used that playbook argument with Cole Komet last year, too. I, it, it's just another thing that I think ownership, whoever's evaluating this whole thing, they, they need to be asking questions like that. Like, even if there's a valid reason for it, like, okay, then at least at, the questions need to be asked. These things need to be brought up. And it's just, and the, in a much larger sense, the Cordero Patterson thing in Atlanta right now. Like, this is peanuts compared to that. It's just another one, another example. All right, we got to get out of here. Follow us on Twitter at Adam Hogue, at K Fishbane for Kevin. Read him on The Athletic. Read me on NBCSportsChicago.com. Check us out on YouTube. Check out the merch on AviShirts.com. We appreciate you guys. Thanks to our producer, Kent Garrison. We will be back Thursday to break things down and make our predictions for the Bears-Packer game. And uh, also, we'll have a special guest in line for Thursday as well. We'll talk to you then. See ya. Go Bears.